Hey everyone, I'm Lance Gibson, and we're so glad you're joining us online for worship today. While we're waiting for the service to start, we would love to know who you are and where you're watching from. So feel free to say hello in the comments section down below. Now is also a great time to like and share this video so that your friends and family can join us as well. I'm looking forward to our time together this morning as we worship through singing, prayer, and the study of God's word. Thanks again for being here. The service will begin shortly. But good morning, everybody. Man, we're so glad you joined us at Quell Springs Baptist Church this morning. Hey, if you were at Falls Creek this week, make some noise. Yeah. Man, we believe in the work that God does at Falls Creek when students and adults get away, get outside of the normal routines of life and just get face to face with the word and with the gospel. Man, we just continue to see God uh, provide in amazing ways and do miracles in Falls Creek Week. So we're so excited that our church goes down and gets to be a part of that. We're also excited VBS is coming up this week. Man, if you're a volunteer, if you're gonna be working at, at, at VBS this week, will you make some noise? Let me hear you. Yes, thank you for what you're doing. You're making an impact of the kingdom in ways that man, we'll, we'll never know the full extent of it. I know the first times that I remember hearing the gospel, some of the first times that I remember hearing it were at VBS. When somebody had me in a, in a class and I didn't care what they were talking about, I was just there for the goldfish. They were... Bell Springs Baptist Church. I'm thankful that our own Dr. Jeff DiGiacomo will be preaching God's word in our services today. God has gifted Jeff in so many ways as a leader, and I thank God for him, Laura, and their boys. I know that you're going to be blessed by his message. Michelle and I are away today on a mission journey with a team from Quail Springs, led by our missions pastor, Ray Anderson. We're in El Salvador, so pray for us. Every morning, we'll be in different schools, teaching character lessons and sharing the gospel with students. And then each evening, we'll be in neighborhoods doing door-to-door -door evangelism and presenting the message of Jesus in neighborhood block parties. We're asking for God to do great and mighty things to bring people to Jesus Christ. I hope you have a great Sunday, and I look forward to being back with you next week. Amen. We're going to continue to sing this morning. Y'all stay on your feet. We're going to make much of Jesus, put him on display. We're going to celebrate the gospel. We're going to sing with joy.
people of God, that he saves. When we came up to an impassable place for our salvation, he saved us. We sing our story to him. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. Rescue me so I can stand and see I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescue me so I can stand and sing. I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. I've been here. 
church. Y'all can have a seat. Timothy chapter 4, as you're turning there, uh, last week and this week have been in our important weeks in the life of our church, but also in our nation and country. Uh, you'll hear from Dylan Bone at the end of the service about False Creek. It was a great week. I'll let him share all the good details uh, that, come, that came out of that week. Uh, you'll get to hear more about that. This coming week is VBS. Our children's ministry staff has been hard at work. You guys like the uh, stage decor behind us? Yeah. yeah, so we know that VBS is upon us. We do want to encourage you two things. One, when you leave, I know outside these center doors, there are some bracelets you can pick up. Those are the leaders that will be uh, serving during VBS. We want you to be able to pray for them uh, as they serve and as they share the gospel with children. And then tonight at 5.30, from 5.30 to 6 in the chapel, we'd ask you to come join us. We're just going to do a special time of prayer, a guided prayer time for Vacation Bible School uh, and the impact that it will have on the lives of children. Also, in our country, this last week uh, was the, uh, decision, the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. And the... And then this week is important because there are elections that we'll participate in. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to lead us in a time of prayer uh, as we begin our time together this morning. Father, thank you for your faithfulness in our life. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together. God, we thank you so much for what you did in the lives of teenagers last week at False Creek. We thank you for the number of students who moved from being dead in their sin to alive in you. We thank you for those that have made the decision to walk in obedience through baptism and publicly declare their salvation testimony. We thank you for those that were called to ministry and for others who just have assurance that they're walking faithfully with you. Thank you for the student ministry staff and their hard work and the leaders that went with them. And Father, we thank you for Vacation Bible School and the privilege that we have next week to host that here on our campus. And so we pray that as these children come, that you'll use the leadership and the staff to clearly present the gospel and that children's lives would be changed for eternity. Father, we thank you for our pastor and Michelle and Ray Anderson and the team that has joined them in El Salvador, God, we pray that you'd use them as they go into these schools, that they would be able to clearly share the gospel and that many would come to faith in you. Father, for Ray Griffin and the team that's in Poland, as they are in this orphan camp, Father, we pray that you would use them to love on, to encourage, and to share the gospel with those who need it. Father, we give you praise for the decision of the Supreme Court. And Father, we thank you that life in the womb is protected. And Father, but we also know that that decision has brought anger, sadness, fear, and the life of many in our nation. And so Father, I pray while we celebrate that decision as believers, as people who hold on to the sanctity of life and that belief, God, I pray that you would use us to demonstrate godliness in the way that we interact with those who may disagree. I pray that we would be kind and gracious. I pray that we'd be able to declare truth in a loving way. Father, I pray that we would double down in our efforts to care for mothers and children and even families that are in need of help. Father, I pray you'd raise up people who would adopt children who are born in unplanned pregnancies. Father, I pray that your spirit would be at work, that the church would rise up 
that we wouldn't just celebrate a court's decision, but that we would be on the front lines of caring for those who need care in the days ahead. And Father, for the elections coming, we know that any time that there's an election, we as Christian citizens have a responsibility to participate. And so, Father, I pray that we would do our duties, that we'd follow your will and direction in our life. And Father, that as all of it works together, we know that it's not outside of your control and we hold and trust in you to bring all of that to goodness. God, we pray as we open up your word this morning that you'd speak to our hearts, that your living and active word would bring transformation in us. And God, as we understand as godliness is right belief with obedient action, that those two things would take place in our hearts today. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So imagine with me for just a minute, you're in a room. It's covered in bright green wallpaper. You're amazed at how bright green this wallpaper is. And then you step foot into an adjoining room and it's still a green room with green wallpaper, but there's just maybe a little hint of blue. And then you step into the third um, room and it's still green, but there's a little bit more blue in the green than there was in the previous room. And let's just say that you repeat this step 50 times. So you stand in the 50th room and they hand you the sample of the wallpaper from the very first room and you're shocked at how green it is. And then you suddenly realize that you're standing in a blue room. See, this idea happens often when people move away from Jesus. In fact, subtle influences edge one away from pure belief that which ultimately is no belief at all. This has been happening throughout history. We're going to read about it in scripture, but it's been happening. It's happening today. There are thousands of people who've succumbed to the siren songs of legalism, mysticism, or asceticism. The tragedy is that their departure was so unnoticeable as they drifted that way that they did not know that their belief had changed. This is happening in 1 Timothy chapter 4 in the Ephesian church there. It, the believers there had done so well in the gospel. They'd come to faith in Jesus, but then they found themselves... Um, some of them found themselves kind of believing certain aspects as it relates to marriage and, and uh, food. So they began to take on these beliefs and basically they began to say that a path to spirituality was dependent upon you and your, your ability to forbid marriage and abstain from food. And if you would do these things, then you, righteousness would be achieved. And so they had left this idea that Jesus Christ is where our salvation is founded and he is the one who authors our salvation and on his work, that is how we are saved, not on our own works. And so what began to happen is that there began to be these false teachers in there. So Timothy, so Paul writes to Timothy in this letter to give him instructions on how to detect error and then how to combat it when it arises. And I think he kind of gives, I summarize them into four actions. Four actions that somebody whose life has been shaped by the gospel will put into practice on a regular basis. And that's what we're going to read this morning. Now, I want to be honest with you. I struggle with what part of 1 Timothy chapter 4 to preach. And I decided to preach the whole chapter. So bear with me, okay? Let's read it together, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressively says that, th that in the la latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars and the consciences are seared, whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. And if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. 
For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Verse 11, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which has been given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I want to give this disclaimer. This message is that you have the understanding that in order to be shaped by the gospel, one, you have to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And two, to be shaped by the gospel, you have to be rooted in the word of God, meaning that it has to be a daily part of your life. And so the first action that I believe you take if your life is shaped by the gospel that we see Paul instructing Timothy is is this. A life shaped by the gospel detects error. We see in the first five verses that Paul is addressing the false teachers. The latter times, Paul believed he was in latter times because from the moment Jesus came and lived in human form until the day that we're reunited with him, Paul just believed that he was in the latter times. And so as he speaks about that, he says this, there's going to be some who depart from the faith. This is no difference for you and I because the same is true today. If we're in the latter times, which we are, there are still people who are departing from the faith. And these some are people who once professed Christ as Savior, but have now given their allegiance to some false teaching. And he describes them as deceitful spirits. This actually is a reference to false teachers. It's not a supernatural working of uh, of a demon in in the heart of somebody. The deceitful spirit is referring to an actual false teacher. These that are spreading this information about marriage and abstinence from food. But they are influenced by the teachings of demons, demonic influence. Paul knows that the enemy is not just a tempter, who entices people to, to uh, sin. He's a deceiver that, that seduces people into uh, wrong belief and wrong action. And so we know that this has happened because we see it in the life of Judas. I mean, Judas was with Jesus, yet still betrayed him. And so we know that the enemy's at work. And I'll say this, if you're oblivious to the enemy's work in, in the life around you, And that's your own fault. Because he's at work every day trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus called him the father, the liar, and the father of all lies. And this is why people, well-intentioned, educated, intelligent people can easily be deceived by false teachers. Is because the enemy's at work. He wants to delude and he wants to blind us to truth. And that's what's happening. Paul's bringing that to Timothy's attention here. He uses in verse two, he says, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. These false teachers would present themselves as faithful servants. Paul would use, some of your Bibles might actually call them hypocrites. That these were people who had a mask of true devotion, but they actually had other intentional motives, which was to share information that was not true, that did not align with the scripture and with the gospel. They had no sense of wrongness because their conscience had become seared. I'll say this about our conscience. Our conscience is the ability to discern right from wrong. And it's connected to our will. And so a good conscience is guided by faith. And your faith enables you to navigate life's moral issues. A seared conscience is left scarred, unable to assess truth and error, and incapable of producing godly behavior. I don't know about you, but I grew up in the country. My grandfather had some cattle, and they used to brand it with a hot iron brand. 
And actually that smell still like exists in my nose when I talk about it. It's just not a very pleasant thing. But they would brand those cows and it had an it had a emblem on it that marked that those cows belonged to my grandfather and his brother. And so when it talks about their conscience being seared, it's almost like that the enemy has a foothold on them and there's a sense of ownership. There's also this sense of it being cauterized where it, like, it becomes deadened and they, they don't become aware of the truth anymore and their ability to discern between those. And if we're not careful, Paul lays out a, a system that happens that if you as a believer are not careful, you can easily fall into the same trap and find yourself walking through different rooms with, with a hint of a certain color until you end up in a room that doesn't, have an, that doesn't have the same color in which you started. And this is the process that it says. They turned a deaf ear to their conscience so many times that it became deadened. That they couldn't determine right and wrong anymore because they, for so long they turned their ear to this. Then they became hypocritical liars, masking as true believers, but believing in something that wasn't true. And then eventually they just took on, and I think about this is uh, the dangers of YouTube, right? I can sit down with YouTube and begin to take in a bunch of information from somebody who's sh sharing information with me that's not true. So then I take on what these, these insincerity liars, these hypocritical liars are doing, and I become influenced by them. And then in turn... I began to lead others astray because of this belief. And this is a warning for us that we've got to be able to detect error at the beginning. And I'm going to tell you this, the only way that you can do that is by having a life that's shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ that's rooted in scripture. These false teachings, and some of us would be easy to say, well, oh, you must just be talking about some of these things on the left. Well, this would be my right, your left. Okay, you must be talking about some of these things on the left. Sexuality and gender and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I'm also talking about things on the far right too. Where political figures can be my savior. Or legalism like this, that you have to abstain from certain foods in order to receive holiness. Listen, if we're not careful, all of these things can be twisted and turned just enough that they sound pleasing to the ear. And so what Paul is doing is he's pointing out to Timothy, to listen, a life shaped by the gospel detects error and then deals with it accordingly. And for time's sake, I won't break down verses three through four, but basically God gives these, or Paul gives these instructions that, listen, if God created it, it's good. If God instituted it, it's good. And so you can receive it with thanksgiving. It's made holy by the word of God. And what does that mean? It, I think it means this, that Paul was suggesting that in response to the gospel, the believers in Ephesus had learned that there were no food laws. They had a proper understanding through the lens of the gospel about food. And notice that Paul never said everything is good. He said everything created by God is good. Church, we have to be aware that there are things in this world that the world has created or that man has come up with or man has distorted. And we've got to be careful that we don't fall into the trap to believe that that's good. In fact, we cannot confuse creation and fall or order and disorder. We have to celebrate only what God created and instituted, amen? And in verse seven, he gives an a warning about detecting error. He says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. The teaching of these false teachers was heresy, godless and much like old wives' tales. One commentator said this, that their teaching was religiously bankrupt. I would say this, their teaching was like spiritual junk food. It might look appealing for a moment, but it's only gonna leave you in an unhealthy place. Paul was imploring Timothy and even the church today to strongly reject them. Number two, a life shaped by the gospel disciplines self. So once you detect this error or you see this error, there's other responsibilities you have. And, and one of those is di disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness. Godliness involves right belief and obedient action. To train is to exercise ourselves. And to exercise ourselves, we have to have discipline and purposeful decision-making. 
I don't know about you, but I have not found the person who woke up one day and were trained for whatever they wanted to do. I'm still looking for the person who uh, woke up trained to run a marathon on that morning and ran a marathon. That's, if they did that, they're just insane. People don't stumble into exercise. I don't know about you, but like my, natu- my natural inclination is to stay in bed longer. I don't just wake up and stumble into exercise. I, I have to make a purposeful decision making to do it. And let's be honest, godly habits, they don't just form themselves. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ and you place your faith and trust in him, this is what happens. The Holy Spirit begins to work in you. And Jesus changes your life. He moves you from death to life. But you have a responsibility to change your lifestyle. Think about that for just a minute. If you're going to be able to stand firm in a world where falsehood abounds, if you're going to be able to stand firm even within the church where there might be some leanings that are of false teaching, you're going to have to put in work to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. It isn't just going to happen. And the first place that you begin when it comes to disciplining yourself is the word of God. Meditation in scripture is indispensable to Christian health and growth. I, I shared this quote this week. I read it. It's a, you guys are all going to know it as soon as I say it. Give a man a fish and feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and feed him for a lifetime. Let me put that in spiritual terms for you. Give a believer a word and feed him for a day, but teach a believer how to read, study, and meditate upon scripture and you'll feed him for a lifetime. This is why discipleship is important. It's why we need to be in community with one another is because we want to help each other be rooted in God's word. And to be disciplined in godliness, we first have to start with being disciplined in his word. And I'm fully aware that in a room this size, not everybody in here reads their Bible every day. But if I can implore with you this, please read your Bible every day. Root yourself in the scripture. Discipline yourself to study it and to read it and to know it. John Stott said, you cannot become godly without this godly book. You cannot become familiar with this godly book without becoming godly yourself. Nothing evokes the worship of God like the word of God. Church, we've got to discipline ourselves. Why? Because godliness is of value in every way. Listen, physical fitness is great, but when you die, physical fitness has no benefit to you. You're dead. But godliness has great benefit for you, not only today, but in the life to come. I've never met somebody who was pursuing godliness and thought to myself, that's a really bad idea. Have you? Everybody that I know that was pursuing godliness, I want to be like them. There's something about them that's good. Their relationships seem to be working. They they seem to try to honor the Lord with their words and with their actions. These are good steps that are good right now. But they're also good in the life to come. That if we if we discipline ourselves for godliness right now and we take we practice self-control in our own life, we'll reap the benefits in the life to come because of it. Listen, godliness is is the effort to be self-controlled so that you can reap the benefits now and in the life to come. And this practice of godliness is a trustworthy saying as you read in verse 9. Why is it trustworthy? Because it's profitable for all things. And it's also why we toil and strive, verse 10. For this to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God. One commentator said, because the Ephesians had hoped upon the promise of the gospel, their lives were filled with a vigorous effort an activity that proved the present and future usefulness of the gospel. Think about this. Because they had hoped on the gospel, they were filled with vigorous effort. The word for toil is strenuous labor that zaps energy. I have a ditch behind my house. Last year, it looked like the Amazon jungle. I have some neighbors that like the ditch to be clean. Mine was the only one in the middle of the neighbors that wasn't cleaned out. 
So I, the only way to clean it out really is to weed eat it. And it takes about an hour and a half just to do that. And so I strap on the weed eater and I get down there and there ain't nothing more strenuous than me being down in that ditch and thinking to myself, nobody even sees this. But it's strenuous work that zaps the energy out of me. Listen, you work hard in your job. Some of you toil really hard in your, for your, with your yard. Some of you work really hard in your marriage. Some of you work really hard in parenting your kids. Some of you work really hard in your hobbies to craft it. Some of you pursue academics and sports and whatever. And you toil and strive like no other. But when it comes to godliness, you like take a backseat to mediocrity. And I would say this, the pursuit of godliness is more important for this life and the life to come than any of those things I just mentioned. In church, we've got to toil and strive. The word for strive is like an athlete putting the last ounce of energy they have into a competition in order to reach their goal. You guys probably saw it was a viral thing, but I think a, a, uh, uh, was it a race where like, the shoe fell off and he put his shoe, and everybody took off running, but he stopped and put his shoe back on or it was a girl, I can't remember. And I can't help but think that there had to be something about striving in that race that they actually came back and, and like won. To give everybody a head start like that to say that as an athlete, I'm gonna strive to do this. I'm gonna give every ounce of energy I have in order to reach the goal. This is an ongoing thing, as the Greek language would tell us, that this is an ongoing action that's happening here. And it's ongoing because of this. They have their hope in the living God. Why do I want to get up every day and pursue godliness and train myself for the purpose of godliness? Because I have a hope in a living God. God is alive and present with you. He's actively working among us. Listen, his spirit was in this room before you walked in. He's sitting with you right where you are. He is active and living. And this is why we discipline ourselves for the godliness because our hope is in him. He's defeated sin and death. The enemy has no victory in him. Listen, there will be some who walk away from the faith and we'll grieve that they walked away from the faith, but we won't be discouraged because the church will triumph because it's built on Jesus Christ. And we strive for this. And listen, I want to be clear because there's a, a, a word in here that some might say, I don't understand what this means, so I want to do this. Our hope is set in the, living, in the living God who is the Savior of all people. Some might think that Paul's become a universalist, but it is not a statement on universalism. In fact, it's best understood this way. The idea of Savior of all men is best understood that Jesus was a ransom for the sins of all. But in those believers who trust in Jesus, he is a savior far deeper in a, in a more profound sense. That's why you see the words that follow, especially of those who believe. This is an assurance of salvation for those who receive Christ, that our hope in Jesus is not in vain. God is the only one who can save people. But he's given us a message of hope, the gospel message to share with people. And this is why we discipline ourselves and toil and strive so that the gospel can be shared. I pursue godliness so that the gospel can be shared, so that people can know the saving faith of Jesus Christ. And then he, we need to discipline ourselves in our example. We discipline ourselves, as you see in verse 12, in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. And speech and life are outward traits. In fact, we know this, that speech is a valid indicator of a person's character. The end of Matthew 12, verse 34, it says, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Our conduct, the way we live life, the way we do business, we're to set an example of godliness in those, in those places. So we gotta have an example of outward traits that, that mark us by what we do and what we say, but also inwardly in love, faith, and purity. Paul wanted to see Timothy love God and love others, that through the work of the Holy Spirit in him, he would be able to love God more and that he would be able to love other people in the same way that Jesus loved him. He also wanted Timothy to have a deep reliance on, on God, 
faith in him and trust that he will carry through the things that he says he's going to do. And he wanted Paul to be, or he wanted, Paul wanted Timothy to be pure in heart, sexually, that purity would be down in there. And that he would become pure inwardly because from the inside is what comes out. And so if, if these things, if he set an example for the believers there in these ways, then good things will come of it. He also needs to discipline himself with the gifts that God has given him. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift that you have. Listen, this gift was given to Timothy by God. It doesn't say specifically what the what the gift is, but what we know is this, is that when you become a believer and trust in Jesus, the Spirit gives you a gift or gifts to be used for the purpose of God's glory and the advancement of his kingdom. And Timothy was being implored not to neglect the gift, and we are too. We've got to discipline ourselves to use God's gift. Some of you are sitting in your seat not using the gift that God has given you. And you need to get out of your seat and use it because you're neglecting it. Some of you use your gifts every week. Keep doing it. Don't fall into the trap of neglecting that gift. You gotta continue to discipline yourself. And then we gotta discipline ourselves and our practice. You see in verse 15, practice these things and immerse yourself in them. Practice is to be diligent. Timothy could think on these things or he could actually do them. I don't know about you, but I've been really guilty sometimes of sitting in a sermon or in a class where the Bible's being taught and I'm thinking about those things and then I leave and I don't do anything with them. And then the next day I might think about that sermon from the day before and I think about it, but I don't actually do it. I think what Paul's intention here was is that Timothy was going to think about Paul's instruction and then he was going to do it. He was going to immerse himself in it. And when you immerse yourself and practice these things, people will see your progress. And I want to say this clearly. The world does not need to see a fake you. They need to see a real you. They need to see what a pursuit of godliness looks like in the life of a sinner who's been redeemed by Jesus Christ. They need to see that when you make a mistake, but in your pursuit of godliness, you get up and walk in repentance, you own it and you move forward. This is what it says when you practice these things and immerse yourself in them, that the world is watching you. And when they watch you, they will respond. In fact, one commentator said this, as believers, we're all on a road to becoming more like Jesus. We just need to humbly move forward each day in our pursuit of godliness. And as we do it, we may, people may be saved as a response of you living a faithful life. You can't save them, but God may use your testimony to draw them to himself. And then I don't think I need to say anything else, but discipline yourself to keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Number three, a life shaped by the gospel declares truth. If you go back to verse six, says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. What is the strategy with false teaching and error that exists in our world today? Here is the strategy. Detect and expose error. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness and holiness and declare truth. Because... The best way to refute error is to positively present truth. Listen, the church has to learn this. There are too many believers, and what I mean by this is I don't mean go to your social media and post something. What I mean by is this. When things are happening and falsehoods are being shared or false teaching is arising, the church cannot be silent. We have to declare truth. That's what he said. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Timothy was to put this topic of the false teaching that they were dealing with before the brothers. And he would be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Listen, we've got to speak for truth. 
Much like a waiter serves a guest at a table, a merchant displays merchandise to a customer, Timothy was laying a foundation of truth for the believers in Ephesus of what they would build their life upon. And that is what we are to do too, to proclaim truth. And how do you do this? It comes from a personal nourishment of your own self. And I'll repeat a little bit here about discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, but here's what I know is this. One commentator said, as a disciple of Christ, Timothy had made a past commitment to Christian obedience and had been consistent in his practice. A Christian can receive no higher compliment. There is no better nourishment for one's spiritual life than a constant dwelling upon scriptures and the doctrines of faith. Our life and teaching flow out of our spiritual nourishment. And if your spiritual well is empty, then you're go- it's going to be easy for you to be deceived and for you to deceive others with a, with a misconstrued truth. We as believers, especially spiritual leaders, some of you teach in this church on a Sunday or Wednesday night. Some of you have influence at camps and vacation Bible school and other things. Listen to these words. You cannot neglect your personal spiritual development. When this happens, you lose your power and effectiveness in ministry. The best teachers in the faith are always the best learners. May we never stop learning. I remember being a little kid in Sunday school one time. They asked a question. I was like, I already know the answer to that. I've already read that. If I'm to be really honest with you, some of what I read, uh, if I read it today, would still speak to me and I'd still learn something new from it. Because God's word is living and active, right? And we need to be continued learners of it. Verse 11 says, command to teach these things. The word command was used by Paul to encourage Timothy in his timidity to boldly proclaim. It says this, Timothy was to urge his words in such a way to make obedience easy. Think about that. He was to urge his words in such a way to make obedience easy. What was he trying to get them to do? Pursue godliness. This is what our world needs today, brothers and sisters. We need genuine godliness. What are you doing to discipline yourself for it? And what truths are you declaring as a result of it? And then finally, as a part of this declaring truth, you got to devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, exhortation, and teaching. I don't think these need explanation other than this. There's a reason why we gather together on a weekly basis to read God's word. It's so that it can be proclaimed, so that truth can be heard, so that we can know if we hear something that is outside of the Bible that we have a, we have a way to draw it back to. There's a reason why the word is preached on a weekly basis. It's to help you as the listener and myself hear God's word and then do something with it. It's to help us understand how to make life decisions based upon it. And then there's a reason why teaching takes place. It's to help us intellectually wrap our minds around the doctrines of our faith. And so we cannot neglect it because a life shaped by the gospel will declare truth. And this is the final point, And it's super fast because it's the last sentence of verse 16. A life shaped by the gospel determines to finish well. Persist in this. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Perseverance is evidence of salvation. Perseverance is not Merit for salvation. Meaning this, salvation always originates in the grace and mercy of God. You cannot do anything to earn salvation. But what we do know is this, if you persist in these things, disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness, detecting error and exposing it, declaring truth, if you persist in these things, you will show that you are saved. Salvation has a beginning point at conversion. It comes to full realization when we're united with Christ. And everything in between is this thing called sanctification, in which we're becoming more like Christ in person and behavior. And when this takes place and you stay the course, 
You will show yourself to be saved and you will show other people how to be saved. When the preacher models perseverance, it builds the same trait in his flock. I'll say the same to you. When you model perseverance in your family, your family will follow suit. But if you stumble and fumble as a wandering spiritual leader, you will infect a congregation or a family in a negative way. We as believers have to persevere in godliness and be saved from false teachings that can wreck the soul. We know the name Mark Price here because he's an Oklahoma native that played in the NBA. Mark Price played for the Cleveland Cavaliers. His basketball skills were phenomenal, but he was not, he was an average sized man playing among giants. Once in front of a group of men and boys, he asked, he was asked, how, do you, how did you become so exceptional in basketball being so small? He responded, there were many Friday nights I was alone in the gym shooting foul shots and long range shots while everyone else was out on a date or hanging out with friends. I remember the work with my father, shooting and correcting, shooting and correcting, dribbling and passing, and then doing it all over again. He said in high school, he was an all-stater, Georgia Tech an all-conference player and then drafted in the NBA. Listen, this is what I know. Physical strength and excellence require conditioning and training, dedication and hard work. But spiritual strength and maturity requires the same. Not many people are willing to discipline their spiritual lives. Listen, church, because too often we're satisfied with mediocrity or in some cases, we're satisfied with watching others live for Christ. When one trusts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they become rooted in God's word, they will have a life shaped by the gospel that will be able to detect error, that will be able to help you discipline yourself, that you'll be able to declare truth because you stand upon it, and hopefully you'll be able to finish well. If every head's bowed and every eye's closed, we'll move into a time of response. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I have three questions for you. The first is this. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? The second. Is your life rooted in the word of God? Are you regularly spending time in it, studying it, meditating it, memorizing it? And third, which one of those actions that we talked about today, detecting error, disciplining yourself, declaring truth, or finishing well, which one are you struggling with the most that needs attention this morning? Maybe you're here and you've found yourself believing in some teachings that aren't necessarily true. You've kind of wandered away and this morning the Lord's used this message as a firm reminder to get you back grounded in his truth and pure belief. Maybe you're here and you've been lazy in your faith. You haven't really put the effort in to pursue godliness and God's used this word this morning to tell you to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness because it's profitable now and in the life to come. Maybe you're here and you've been timid to declare truth with friends or with family. And today the Spirit's worked inside of you to build you up. And maybe some of you are in here, you're about to throw in the towel of the Christian faith because it isn't going like you thought it would go or it's not happening like you thought it would happen. And God used this as a reminder to you to say, determined to finish well today. When we stand and sing in just a minute, I'm gonna ask you to respond however the Lord leads you in one of those areas. You can sit and pray. You can come and kneel and pray. You can meet a minister up front, ask them to pray for you. 
But here's what I am going to ask you to do. If godliness is right belief and obedient action, then that would tell me that if God's revealing something to you now, then you need to be obedient to it to pursue godliness. And so this morning I pray that you'll respond to how the Lord leads you. Father God, I pray that you'd use your word being living and active to bring change and transformation in us. God, help us right now decide how to respond. Maybe it's a commitment. Maybe it's surrendering for salvation. Maybe it's confession. God, I pray that however you lead us, that we would all respond so that we might live a life that is shaped by the gospel so that others may know the saving grace that we have in you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together. I pray that we 
that you've been glorified by the worship of your people as we've lifted high your name through singing and the proclaiming of your word, the giving of tithes and offerings. Father, I pray as we leave this place, we'll be mindful of your presence in us and around us. That you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, I pray you'd give us opportunities to declare your truth. Father, I pray, understanding this, that the enemy is crouching around the corner, waiting to seek, to steal, and destroy. And God, I pray that he'd have no victory, that we'd press into you, that we'd pursue godliness. And Father, that we would be able to detect those areas of our life where error might be. Father, I pray that you'd help us finish well. God, we need you, and we thank you for what you do in our life, and we pray this in your name. Amen. You can uh, be seated. If you're a first-time guest with us, we'd like to uh, give you a gift and meet you. I'll, I'll stand in for the pastor today out in the archway outside these doors. We'd love to be able to shake your hand and say thanks for being here today. Uh, you can turn your attention to the screen for some announcements. Good morning. Thank you for joining us to worship this morning. Here's a look at what is coming up at Quail. Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow night. There's still time, however, to sign up at qsbc.org slash vbs. VBS runs June 27th through the 30th from 6 to 8.15 p.m. This evening, we will have a guided prayer service in place of our normal Sunday evening service. Please join us from 5.30 to 6 p.m. in the chapel as we pray for VBS and all of the children and families that will be in our church this coming week. It's time for the track challenge. For the month of July, pick up a gospel track on a Sunday morning and make it a priority to share the track with someone during the week. This is a great way to train yourself to look for opportunities to share the gospel. Check out qsbc.org slash tracks for more information and be ready to pick up a track next Sunday. WAC is back at QSBC. WAC stands for Worship Arts Camp for Kids and it will be held here July 25th through the 27th for kids that have completed third through the fifth grade. The cost is $50 and you can register today at qsbc.org slash events. If you have any questions, contact Angela Lee at alee at qsbc.org. Thank you again for being here this morning. Don't forget that we will not have Wednesday night fellowship dinner or activities this week due to VBS. Have a great week. Well, good morning, church. As you can see around, there are some students wearing some t-shirts that I'm wearing right now. And if you can't see from, from here, it is the Old Faithful Geyser. Our theme this past week at Falls Creek was faithful. And the idea that we went over that God is faithful to save despite our sin, God is faithful to sustain us fully, and that God is faithful to send us on mission. And it was an awesome and incredible week. We took 330 students and volunteers to Falls Creek this past week where we saw the Lord do an incredible work. There was absolute clarity and growth that happened within our group. We saw students come to know Jesus. We saw students get baptized. We saw students get the, the call to ministry. And we saw students working through the sin, working through the rough parts that they've been walking through and giving it to Jesus. And I just want to say to you, church, Thank you for your scholarships. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, there are students that went to camp that gave their life to Jesus that what would have not gone to camp because they could not have gone without the scholarship. So your scholarship provided an opportunity for a student to come to know Jesus, and the Lord provided. The Lord worked through it, and we praise the Lord for that. Um, I want to point our attention to the screen. You can see our, our group right there. What a beautiful, beautiful group. Uh, if you look at the screen now, we're going to show the seven baptisms that we got to do at Falls Creek. This is Canyon Rose. Can we get up, give it up for Canyon Rose? 
Can I ask two questions for you? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you vow to walk faithfully with Him for the rest of your life? Yes. It's my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear with Christ in baptism and raise the Lord. Amen, amen. You got to see seven there, and there's about 10 more that are going to be coming in the, the coming weeks and months, and we praise the Lord for that. The great thing about Quail Springs is we gather together, we build one another up in the, in the preaching of God's word, and we send out. And this is a church that doesn't just sit on Sundays, sit on Wednesdays, and not do anything else. Uh, we have prayer bracelets out there for VBS, because VBS is this week. I had a, a member at the 815 service come up after me and then said, all my friends think I've been in the hospital for the last month because of all the bracelets I've been wearing. <laughs> I'm thankful that we have a church that trusts that the Holy Spirit is the one that goes before us, that we seek the Holy Spirit to, to change lives, to open opportunities for students, for children to come to know Jesus. And I pray that you would grab another one for another week, that you would pray that the Lord would do a mighty work in the lives of of our children and our, and our sponsors. I'm gonna pray and then we'll be dismissed. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your living and active word, Lord. I thank you it is the one thing that we can count on, the one thing that we can build our life upon. In a world of error, in a world of deceit, we can discern it because we know your word. We thank you for making it available to us. Lord, I thank you for Falls Creek this past week. I thank you for the 70 sponsors and cooks that, that went with us, that poured into our students' lives. Lord, what a blessing it was to see students lead their friends to Jesus. To see students, after they make a decision, have absolute clarity of where they're going for eternity and, and to know their testimony. For students to, call, to feel the call to ministry. And Lord, just the encouragement and the life-giving opportunity it was for many, many of our students. Lord, we thank you for the work that you did there. And I pray that it continues and continues to grow and the, the church sees the fruit of it. God, I pray for VBS. I pray for the workers. And I pray that you'd give them patience. You would give them wisdom as they talk to these children and lead them to a, a deeper understanding of who you are. We trust and put all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.